sure thing. Everything okay out there? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, I see a few empty chairs out there. I'm surprised there's so many people still around here tonight. I'm uh, probably going to disappoint you because I'm not going to talk about the 23 budget, which is the thing everybody wants to know about. Um, I, I know you've had a lot of other uh, conversations today, so I'm just going to talk for a few minutes and give you a chance to ask me a few questions. Uh, what, what I thought I might do to start out was talk a little bit about how I see the world from my new new perch, if you will. You know, everybody knows I spent a lot of time in the acquisition technology and logistics side of the house, and uh, before that I was uh, government service and in industry, and then before that uh, an army officer. Worked in government on the R&D side for a long time. Uh, and now I'm in a, in a service leadership position, which is a military department leadership position, which is a very different perspective. And things that I understood on one level in my, when I was in OSD are much more real and visceral to me and impressing. Uh, and I'm going to say a couple of words about that and what I'm, what I'm finding after several months in the Department of the Air Force. The services all have this, this set of problems to various degrees, but I think the Air Force has it uh, in spades. And that's trying to balance current needs with future needs and trying to do all the things we need to do to be a healthy institution at the same time as we're meeting the needs of combatant commanders around the world. Uh, there's a lot of tension there. And uh, part of my job, frankly, is to try to resolve that tension as best I can. Now, you heard about the seven imperatives earlier. Uh, those are focused on conventional warfighting and modernization and getting to a place that's different than the place we're in right now and more effective against the threats that I see. So that's what that's all about. So I see a need to kind of rebalance towards that. And I've been talking f since 2010 about the threat that China poses in particular and what their military modernization means for our ability to project power. So while I'm trying to work to, to identify, first of all, the most important things for us to do to be effective, taking advantage of a new generation of technologies and moving beyond in some cases, some current operational concepts, and also funding things to take care of some problems that over the last 20 or 30 years we were not focused on. At the same time, I'm trying to support the needs of current combatant commanders who are, I won't say insatiable is the right word, uh, but they have big problems and they need forces to help uh, achieve their objectives in different parts of the world. Certainly, obviously, China, but as we watch what's happening right now in Ukraine, uh, very much so in Europe as well and the threats from uh, uh, CENTCOM, the Middle East, uh, have not disappeared either. And North Korea, is, uh, as you may have seen, is expanding its nuclear program. So all these things uh, need to be met by demonstrations of American abilities and the potential to increase our capability there at the same time uh, that we're trying to get ready for the future. And the Air and Space Forces, especially the Air Force, are in constant demand. Uh, and so that's, that's part of my world now in a way that it wasn't before. The other thing that's part of my world now in a way that it wasn't before is the realization of the very high burden of carrying the capital investments of the past poses. We have uh, a fleet of aircraft that's average age is about 30 years. And as time goes on, the cost to maintain those aircraft tends to go up. Uh, the demands on them that I just mentioned mean they're used more. And so those costs are pressure on us. At the same time, we're trying to modernize for the future. So that's, that's a more real dilemma to me, a more real set of problems in many ways than I had confronted when I was really just worried about acquisition programs and, and transition to technology and current logistics uh, events. We're meeting that requirement, but in my view, the risks that we face as a country are going to be increasing over time which means that we will need more capabilities in the future than we have right now. And technological change is happening at such a pace that we really need to take advantage of that, as our potential adversaries are, to field new capabilities to meet the emerging threats that we see. So that's, that's the, 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 the mix that I'm dealing with. And I am focused on modernization. I've been worried about China. Some of you heard me speak uh, 20 years ago, maybe, 12 years ago, when I came into the Obama administration in 2010. Jim's nodding his head. He can remember some of those things. Uh, it's still China, China, China for me. Russia is obviously, uh, current events demonstrate that, 
uh, a, 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 a significant power to be concerned with. And it's capable of the type of aggression and action which I think we had a, an emotional event. A lot of people didn't think that Putin would do it. Uh, we've been watching this. I've seen him build up his forces multiple times on the uh, borders of Ukraine. And as we watch this one, this time was different. Uh, it was clearly not a show of force this time. He was serious about it. And a lot of people didn't expect that. But now I think for better or for worse, certainly for worse for the Ukrainian people, and I think ultimately for worse for the Russians, uh, we've had a wake-up call. We've had an emotional event that says that yes, war at scale among great powers, among modern powers can actually happen. Uh, it can also happen in the Pacific. And the threat that we face potentially, the pacing challenge in the Pacific, China, has vastly more resources than Russia does and has been investing for almost 30 years to field forces that can uh, keep the United States out of that region, defeat us if we try to interfere in something they might do. So the threats are increasing over time. They're not getting less. And technology is moving at a very fast pace. And so the seven imperatives that you've heard about, and I've spoken several times about them. I'm not going to walk through the list today. Uh, they're driving what we need to do in conventional warfare, as far as I'm concerned. On the strategic side, I think we're actually in reasonably good shape. We are recapitalizing the triad. The national defense strategy and the national security strategy and the posture review are not all out yet. Uh, but you've all seen, I think, in the press that China is modernizing its nuclear and expanding it significantly. So that's a problem that we have to deal with. I think that's sort of removed some of the arguments that maybe we should have a smaller or uh, nuclear, nuclear deterrent and maybe without as many legs of the triad as we currently have. I think those arguments are pretty well put to bed now, given what China is doing. So that part of the equation, I think, is in, is in pretty good shape. We have those programs underway. But I think we have a lot of work to do in terms of the Space Force, in particular, and transitioning from a, uh, a force which was designed for a period when we could operate with impunity in space. And we recognized back in the Obama administration that that was no longer true. And we changed our strategy, but the last several years have been spent trying to figure out what to do about that. And I want to give Jay Raymond and his team a lot of credit. They've made a lot of progress in that area. Uh, and and we're, we're starting down the path, uh, and you will see some of this when you see the 23 budget, that takes us in the direction of having more resilient capabilities in space and that ability to fight through, if you will, the kinds of adversaries we might have to face. We also need to deal with the other side's capabilities in space, potentially. And I think that's something that is often missed. But we depend upon a set of services from space to operate on the surface of the Earth. The other side has been acquiring the other, the, the pacing challenge, certainly, and also Russia, have been acquiring capabilities that threaten our ability to operate uh, and target us, basically. We have to do something about that as well. We, we cannot. Uh, give the other side impunity to operate in space any more than and they're willing to give it to us. So we were, we're in a whole new world there. And I don't, this will probably make some, uh, somebody will quote me on this one, I'm sure. Uh, but there is a large unfunded requirement for the future of space right now. When you look at what we need to have, we have to first of all identify those systems. We have to identify those architectures. Uh, some good work has been started in that area. The Space Development Agency has done some good work. So have some others. But we've got a long way to go to fielding that capability. So there's a bill there that's, that's coming. And we're going to start to pay it. I think you'll see when you see 23, but we've got a ways to go. And I mentioned the, the pressures on the Air Force in general. So I am comfortable, I will tell you this about 23, I am comfortable with where I think 23 is going to end up. I think we'll be able to balance those things that I talked about reasonably well and, and move forward. But as I look out past that, I do see challenges ahead. I do see tough choices ahead of us over the next several years as we better define the things we need and then try to figure out how we're going to pay for them. Uh, so that's the situation that we'll be talking about once we get the budget out and we get started with posture reviews and so on. OK, I think I'm going to stop there, Jim, uh, and we'll take some questions. Can I, can I throw out the first one, sir, while we're? Um, if you have one dollar to spend more, so, and, and so I, forgive me for saying that, that's really not what I want to say. Um, Mike McCord warned us right up front that there were going to be big space right, increases in, in 2023 structurally. Um, General Raymond did a great briefing this morning. He was highly deferential to you. He had a huge smile on his face. It was very obvious things are going well 
in terms of the Space Force. Um, given the speed with which you are trying to drive resources into the Space Force and given the fact that it's a two-year-old organization with about $17 billion, right, can, can that organization, which is so thinly manned and, and engineered at this point in time, can it absorb that level of resourcing that you're going to push into that to try to make sure that the, the war does not expend into space from either the Chinese or the Russians? I didn't get the question. I'm sorry. How much money can you? I'm sorry, sir. How much money can you actually dump into space per year without like, without collapsing it? Oh, I'm not terribly worried about that. Um, we're pretty good at spending money in the Pentagon. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, sir. That's yeah, that's not the answer I was me, looking for. I, sir. I thought you were going to ask me the next dollar question, and I was going to answer it. So, um, if if you confine it to space, um, the next dollar for me goes to missile warning and tracking. The reason for that is because of what the pacing challenge has done. Uh, what, what I became alarmed about in 2010, and what I've been watching progress ever since, is the, the purchase of ballistic and cruise missiles designed to target our high value assets. And so we need, with ballistic missiles in particular, we need abilities to uh, get good warning and tracks on the, so that we can deal with them. Um, so if there were one area which I think we have to have a much more robust capability on, that would probably be it. More generally, I would spend a $1 uh, of additional funding on making sure I, had the, I, I made the right decisions about modernization in general. There's been a lot of effort over the last few years to go fast, right? Speed's been emphasized. Uh, CQ Brown quite appropriately talked about accelerate change or lose, but it's really important that you, that you go in the right direction, that you make the right choices about where to make those investments and where to try to go fast. So the, the reason I'm doing those seven imperatives is to ensure that up front we get all that right, that we head in the right direction. And Mr. Secretary, over here, if that's okay, to your, to your right? To your right? right sir. Start. Hey, sir. Valerie Inseno with Breaking Defense. Um, I'm sure you probably haven't had the time to look over the entire omnibus bill yet, but um, Arrow, the hypersonic weapon program, uh, got a big cut to procurement. Basically, uh, Congress divided that sum in two, took away half of that, put the other half into uh, rdt and &E again. So no way really for the Air Force to start buying those missiles this year. How big a deal is that? And I know that you've been skeptical about how uh, the Air Force has been funding hypersonics. Uh, does does is this a good chance, I guess, for maybe the Air Force to relook at how it's, it's uh, you know, where it's putting that money? Yeah, there, there was a lot of enthusiasm for hypersonics in the, in the previous administration. And I think I've made the, the comment more than once that um, I, I fully understand why China is building a lot of hypersonic capabilities. I think we have to think more carefully about what we need in terms of hypersonic capabilities and not just mirror image what they're doing. You know, the target set that we present to China is very different than the target set that they present to us. And so the needs for munitions aren't going to be symmetrical. They're not going to be the same. Um, so we do need to take a look at our, our whole portfolio, not just hypersonics. Uh, with regard to aerial specifically, I think everyone's aware we've had some test uh, issues there. And I spoke to the contractor recently. They think they're working their way through that and ready to go test again fairly shortly. But aero still has to prove itself. So we, we need to do that. And we also need to take that larger look at uh, what's the right mix for the future? What are the things we really need to invest in? Mr. Secretary, we have a question here. Sir, Bill Conley, Mercury Systems. Good to see you again. How are you doing? Um, so every couple years, there's a new in vogue thing. So a couple years ago, it was cross-functional teams. The one that shows up nearly everywhere now are public-private partnerships. Um, and so I'm curious if you have any advice for us in this room about what you're thinking about with public-private partnerships, how we can be your best partner in that journey together. Yeah, there are a lot of different versions of that. Um, one that I'm proud of, actually, because I think it was a great success, was the uh, public-private partnership approach we took to Space Launch a few years ago. My partner in that endeavor was Ellen Palakowski, who I just saw yesterday. Um, we basically recognized that there was a, a commercial market that people were doing things to, to, to address that market, and that we could supplement private investment essentially with government investment to get our requirements met, help people close your business case, and then up in a win-win for everybody. So that was one example of where we used it. There are lots of other variations on public-private partnerships. 
Uh, I'm very open. I'm, I'm, first of all, I'm not doing acquisition anymore. Uh, I'm trying not to anyway. But I'm very open to creative ways of doing business. And I think where we can work together uh, in a way that's fair and preserves competition in particular, it's, it's to everybody's advantage. So, and, and there are some things, some of the consortia, which I've been a little skeptical about over the years, I think have worked out pretty well, actually, in a couple of cases. So uh, we need to be open to different ways of doing business. The, if we're going to exploit what's available in the commercial world in particular, uh, companies who are not doing work with defense but who might be willing to modify their products a little bit in order to make them more interesting to the defense community, harden them in certain ways, for example, uh, we should be open to that as well. So if you have ideas, Bill, I'd love to hear them. Good to see you again. It's Brian Everson with Aviation Week. Um, I've heard you talk several times now about you're getting a little bit more progress with Congress about being able to cut in order to modernize. You've um, repeatedly said, highlighted some specific aircraft, A-10s, C-130s, MQ-9s. Two of those three just received plus-ups in today's omnibus. Is that a sign that the progress is slowing? How can you go about this process differently <laughs> in the upcoming budget? Yeah, I saw Senator Tester walking out. We shook hands as he was going by. Um, I, I have great admiration for Senator Tester. We work really well together, but he likes his C-130s. Um, uh, we had, I want to thank the Congress, okay? We, we made the case last year to let us retire aircraft, and they, they came through pretty well. I'm, I'm pretty happy with what they did last year. The, the exception was the A-10. Uh, I'm a big fan of the A-10. I'm a former Army officer, and every infantry officer I've ever talked to wants the A-10 there when they need close air support. Uh, but the threats are changing, and I think we're going to have to move beyond that. Uh, and we're, we'll, we'll continue to work with the Congress on this and others. I, I, I will tell you, I think, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself here, but um, I don't think you're going to see the same scale of requested retirements in this budget as you did last year. Uh, but there will still be some. Uh, but I think going forward, uh, as I mentioned, there are going to be some, some hard choices we're going to have to make further out. Another question here. Back right, back right, sir. Go. Thank you. Uh, picking up on a couple subjects uh, regarding space, um, and I'm glad you have an inclination towards space. I'm one of those space startups. I also got a lot of experience under my belt dealing with military, dealing with government, and I am a practicing entrepreneur to the max. We're focused on the moon. I just want to know so I can assure my investors, to be brutally honest, is the moon and cislunar, from a commercial point of view, I know what the answer is. I don't have to ask you that. Mm -hmm. But from a national security interest, is that a near term, and I'm going to say near term, within a few years where dollars are going to start flowing to people like myself that are really rocking on bleeding edge technology, realizing we can't do everything. We focus on niches, right? Within the bounds, and this is a public audience, I understand that, uh, is the moon and cislunar a sparkling area of interest for uh, the Air Force and Space Force, or is the media and people like myself and other investors not really where we should be in expectations? In other words, is it too further down the road when yeah. Uncle Sam will want to take advantage of what's going on on the commercial side? Thank you. Yeah, we've got uh, big issues in Leo, Mio, and Geo um, that we have to address, and those are the priority. The, uh, there may be some applications beyond that. I'd be happy to talk to you and hear your ideas about that. Um, but I don't want to throw cold water on your, your, your there, but. I don't see a lot of interest uh, from the defense perspective in that. There's a lot of interest from the administration. And NASA, obviously, and the Space Council, National Space Council, have a lot of interest in broader things. And there's a lot of opportunity for DOD to work with commercial firms 
on any number of things, right? Uh, a lot of the firms that are pursuing different kinds of services, we've talked about a number of uh, ways in which we could potentially work with the commercial space world uh, to do things that are of mutual interest. But I, I can't say that Lunar or CisLunar even is, is very high on that list right now. Uh, that, that's the trade-off, right? Uh, China's modernizing to have, I, mean, I mentioned the ballistic missiles and cruise missiles, conventional. You know, China is moving beyond that to hypersonics, right? They're, they're, I, I have characterized their ambitions uh, going back years as uh, creating a zone in their near, near abroad, if you will, to use the Russian term, where they could accomplish the goal of keeping the U.S. out and our, and our, and our allies. Uh, and they're trying to extend that range at which they can do that. So um, that, that's part of what we're dealing with. The threat is getting more severe over time. But there's a severe threat now. And I, I don't think anyone can predict with any accuracy when China might do something aggressive <laughs> or not. Uh, they, they have done a number of things to sort of uh, push the envelope a little bit. You know, they've been more aggressive in challenging the ADIs, for example, around, around Taiwan. They've obviously been aggressive in what they've done in the South China Sea, as well as in the Senkaku to some degree. So I, I don't I think we can feel comfortable at any period in time, frankly, but the c capabilities that they're fielding are increasing over time. And so their risk tolerance or their risk uh, perspective, how they see that and how they see a whole bunch of factors, quite frankly, you know, would influence any decision they might make. We're all watching Ukraine right now, and we're all watching to see what happened there. And I think it's a silver lining, if you will, in this tragedy is the unity of NATO, the unity of Western democracies, the unity of people around the world in opposition to what Russia has done, uh, and the economic consequences for Russia, which are going to be very, very severe. You know, China's watching that just as much as anybody else is, and I think that's a strong deterrent, hopefully. Uh, but that doesn't change their ambitions. It doesn't change their goals, and uh, it doesn't completely eliminate the risk. They inherited many capabilities and mission sets from the different services. Which space capabilities do you think the services should retain and which ones should migrate uh, to the Space Force that have not? Um, well, I think they should all go to the Space Force. Um, you know, I think space remains to some degree a little bit fragmented. And one of the problems with space over my whole career has been that there have been a lot of people who had their some interest in space and some involvement and were doing things. Um, so we're working our way through that. I think, um, in general, the point of creating the Space Force was to provide one place in which space activities could be centralized. And we've picked up some things from some of the other services. There are, I think, I don't know if General Raymond mentioned it, but he has MOUs with the services. I think he just signed one with the Army, if I remember right. Um, and there are interest in doing certain things uh, th that are related to their support from the other services. We'll, we'll work our way through that. But the center of mass is clearly going to be the Space Force for military space. The interface that I'm most interested in is the intelligence community in the Space Force. Because uh, we, we have a situation in the U.S. which is an artifact of history. Uh, our, our involvement in space goes back to the Cold War. And in the early days of the Cold War, the intelligence community built satellites to collect intelligence, uh, certain kinds of imaging satellites in particular, and they've stayed on that path and kept that mission, if you will. Whereas the military picked up mil missile warning, uh, strategic uh, communications, and a few other things along the way. So there's a division of labor that's historic in the United States, which is just sort of locked into our structure. And what we need in a space force to support the joint force is the number of capabilities that include the ability to target things on the surface of the Earth. 
for military operational purposes. And that means imaging of one kind or another and other kinds of sensors that help you do that. Um, but those are the traditional role of the intelligence community. So anyway, we've, we've formed a very close relationship between the intelligence community and the Space Force, particularly between the NRO and the Space Force. Chris Calise and I have talked a number of times, and we're working together to understand, first of all, uh, what are the military operational requirements for space going forward, and then where do they overlap with the intelligence community's requirements, and how are we going to meet them all together, both their requirements and ours cooperatively. And I'm very encouraged by the level of cooperation I have with the intelligence community. Uh, Jay Raymond feels exactly the same way. So we're working together to try to sort all that out. And the, our intent is to co-fund the things that we need where there's, where there's overlap in requirements. Uh, good evening, Secretary Kendall, Dave Johnson at L3 Harris. Just a question on ABMS in, in your perspective as you brought some much needed acquisition rigor on the way ahead to that program. Yeah, my observation on ABMS and JADC squared from the outside was that we basically were pursuing a, an idea, a, a theory of the case that by, by integrating sensor data from various sources and using what people label AI, but basically uh, data fusion and other decision-making support kinds of analytics, that we could improve our results operationally. That's the theory of the case. It's not a bad theory. Uh, there's, there is reality in there for sure. But we had not identified exactly what data to do what and what decision making we were gonna automate to some degree or enable by, by modern processing. So what I have asked the team to do is to identify that operational payoff specifically. What are we gonna do differently? And then, to, and then to design around that and to prioritize around the things that have the highest payoff. As I've gotten smarter about this situation in the Air Force and gotten to better understand our current set of capabilities, what I've concluded is we need more than that. Uh, we need more than applicating smart battle management and data fusion and so on onto the system we have. We need to modernize the system. And if you look at air operations centers and other command and control nodes, AWACS and JSTARS, for example, battle management nodes, which are aging out uh, or are increasingly vulnerable to attack, we've got to figure out what the whole architecture looks like and we've got to get on replacing it. Some of our communications links uh, need to be replaced as well. So we've got to, you know, when I said there are, there are there are challenges ahead and there are going to be some tough choices we're going to have to make ahead. That's one of the areas in which we're going to have to do that. We've got to identify what that looks like and we're going to have to invest in and organize to invest intelligently in, in fielding that kind of capability. Jim, over here. Good afternoon, Mr. Secretary. John Turpak, Air Force Magazine. Over on your left. I got you. <laughs> uh, last week you talked about uh, two of your imperatives, the, uh, the fighter class of an un uncrewed aircraft and the strategic uncrewed aircraft. Yeah. The Navy has talked about in, in a decade, per perhaps two-thirds of their uh, carrier air wing would be unmanned aircraft. I wonder if you could uh, kind of forecast. I know the analysis is still in the early stages, but can you forecast what kind of percentages you yeah. might see for the Air Force 10 years from now? Yeah, I, I don't have a number for that, but what I'm determined to do is take the first step in that direction. Uh, and particularly at the tactical level. Um, as I look at the various technology programs that are out there, there's the ACE program at DARPA, Skyborg in the Air Force, the Australian Royal Wingman, and there are others. And I just came back from Air Force Association where I got to talk to some companies that are working. I'm not going to give anybody a plug, but I talked to some companies, particularly some small businesses, uh, that are doing some very interesting things in the unmanned combat aircraft area. Uh, it's it, it is reasonably clear to me that we are poised to go ahead and, and take a significant step forward in that area. And I don't know exactly how long a step that's gonna be, but I'm determined to make it. And once we get to, I'm gonna, it, I think it's more than a minimum viable product, it's, but it's certainly a viable product. Uh, we figure out what that is and start to gain experience. I wanna build a platform that we can use to grow, and, and I said in, at AFA, a platform in the IT you know, tech industry uh, nomenclature, not in the way we normally think about it in defense, but a platform from which we can add technologies, add app applique and additional capabilities, uh, and grow functionality. So I'm, we're going to move forward in that direction. I'm, I'm fairly certain of the general path we're going to follow in the tactical regime. I'm not as sure of the path in the strategic regime, so we may move a little bit more slowly there. Uh, but, but I think it's time to do that. I think it's 
time to take, whatever risk is associated with moving in that direction uh, and trying to get to the first generation of that kind of capability. And then the numbers will follow. Well, one of the reasons, one of the main reasons I'm doing this is that we can't afford the Air Force we currently plan, particularly in the tactical world. Uh, we're, we're buying F-35s and NGAD and F-15 EX, and all of those programs are too expensive to afford across the force. Right now, what we're looking at is a force in which the F-35 is the low end of a high-low mix. That is not going to work. Uh, we're not going to get the F-35 sustainment cost down to a level where that, that's realistic. The production costs, I think, are, uh, we'll, we'll get more there, I hope, as time goes by. But we're up in the 80 million-ish kind of category right now. So that's not a cheap airplane. And so we're, we've got to figure out a way to, to get the capacity, the quantity of capabilities that we need. As Jack Vesey used to say, that quantity has a quality all its own. And he was right. Uh, you need numbers, particularly if you're in a, in a situation where you can expect attrition. Uh, and you need the ability to expand as, as necessary to deal with the threats. And the higher end, more expensive airplanes are not going to get you there. Uh, Secretary Kendall, thanks for uh, coming back to public service and doing this. The, uh, I, I've asked a question to some of your colleagues and partners today uh, about what they need from their other services to make their mission work. And I, you won't be surprised, a number of them mentioned things you're responsible for. But I'll ask the same question to you. What does our Air Force and Space Force need? from its joint partners? Uh, uh, collaboration and uh, reasonable give and take on requirements, the requirements for services from space. Um, it, it, we, what, one of the things I'm doing and I've organized the seven imperatives is each one is led by an operator, a requirements person, and a technologist or an acquisition person. And I've always felt for many decades that the right way to resolve what you're going to buy is to have the, the operators work very closely with the acquisition community. And I need the operators for the services that we work with, the other service, Navy, the Air Force, Navy, the Army, rather, uh, to work closely with us as we sort out what their requirements are for services from space so that we get to a reasonable, affordable place to do the things that, you know, whether it's communications, uh, you know, intelligence, basically, for, for targeting battle management purposes and so on, and, and whatever else, uh, navigation. PNT, uh, on, 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 on the list. We're going to have to work together to sort that out because if you just write down Nirvana, it's not affordable going in, right? So we got to work together to sort that out. Yes, sir. And, sir, I, I, you've been incredibly generous with your time. Oh, sorry. I was almost getting ready to get you off the stage, sir. I apologize. <laughs> yes, sir, picking up on your thought. Um, <clears throat> so you, you were talking about possibly unmanned TAC air, okay. So for strategic, you know, like uh, AWAC replacement, does it look like we might go one more round of manned AEW? <laughs> yeah, the, the, the argument for manned versus unmanned falls on uh, utility and cost effectiveness and, and to some degree feasibility. Um, and and uh, for battle management platforms like AWACs and JSTARs, we're going to have to have battle management nodes with people in them. One of the things that we're going to have to address as we figure out what ABMS really looks like and figure out what JADC squared really looks like is where are the people and what do they do? And I had a little epiphany a few weeks ago. I said, wait a minute. But we haven't figured that out yet. We haven't, you know, we have the AOCs and we have other organizations and we have the manned aircraft right now. But you're, we're going to have to design our battle management system around the battle managers who are controlling the operations, right? Controlling the planning and execution of operations. And I don't think we've done nearly enough work to figure that out yet. So the short answer to your question is, there are going to be men in the loop. Some of them are probably gonna be in airplanes. And you, you've been incredibly generous with your time tonight. Did I you lost track, I'm having fun with the question. It's, questions. A, it's okay, questions. sir. There, there's more of those to come, sir. Don't <laughs> worry. Um, did you wanna deliver, absent one last question? Going once? I got one more. Oh, rats. Oh, I was so close, sir. That's okay. Sir, I got a quick question for you. So we got a perfect template of what you was talking about earlier with the ability for space to work within our own. Have we ever decided to take a look at what we did with cyber in 2012 and we put cyber, General Nakasone, in both 
in charge of both cyber and NSA, and he's able to leverage himself, and we find that has worked, I mean, tremendously. Why haven't we thought about putting Spacecom with NRO and allowing General Richardson, I mean Dickerson, to leverage itself in those capabilities? That's one I hadn't even thought about before. It's, uh, uh, it, it's an interesting idea. Let me go ponder that one for a while. I don't think I know the answer. I do know one part of the answer, which would be it'd be very difficult to do bureaucratically and politically. <laughs> that's, which, so that's an impediment. Um, I, I think we've made a lot of progress in the work cooperation. It goes back to something Ash Carter started quite a few years ago, uh, where we formed, I remember Jigspot, uh, where we basically merged the, the headquarters. And I think we've made a lot of progress in terms of working together. And I'd like to see kind of how that plays out for a while be, before we think about some other arrangement. On that note, sir, may, may I, I had an elaborate deintroduction for you as you left the stage, but you've, as usual, under-promised and over-delivered. Please welcome Secretary Kendall. Thanks so much for coming. Thanks so much.